<laughs> From Waikiki, Honolulu, Hawaii, a big hello. Welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the caregiver's caregiver, coming to you live on demand 24-7 on 14 global platforms all over the earth. And also at caregiver.com, voted number two podcast of the top six best co- podcasts of 2017. We have an exciting interview planned for you today with my lovely co-host, and founder of the caregiver space, Adrian Gruberg. Say hello, Adrian. Hello. Uh, she sounds so nice, doesn't she? <laughs> Today, Adrian and I will be interviewing Betty O'Brien, veteran of the United States Air Force. Let me salute you. Full-time caregiver to her son, who has a very rare brain tumor and is very involved with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and is an advocate on Capitol Hill and her community for increased support. So let's get started. Before we do, I want to thank uh, Helen Justice, author from last week's show, certified geriatric care manager, trained to assist elders and their families with the process of aging and dignity, with dignity and grace. So if you haven't seen that, you can watch that on our website or on any of our uh, global platforms. All right, enough of that. Hey, a big welcome to my guest, Betty O'Brien. Betty, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Tell me, Betty, um, I like to have my guests introduce themselves by answering this question. What would you say is the reason for your being on this earth? What are you, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, I firmly believe that my destiny and purpose in life is to help people and advocate for those who can't, who can't do it themselves. So advocacy and helping. And, of course, protecting our country. Thank you for your service in the military. Thank you for your service. Thank Appreciate you. that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So how did you become a caregiver? You weren't always a caregiver, right? No, I wasn't always a caregiver, but I've always taken care of people. I started um, back in high school. My my jobs in high school were taking care of elderly people. Mm. So I've always had a passion to help people. So how I became a caregiver um for what I'm talking about today is in 2013, my oldest son, who was also uh, in the military, he was an avionics technician on F-15 fighter jets, uh, came, uh, got diagnosed with a very rare brain tumor, medulloblastoma. My. And so that's how, it, that's how it all started. So he's in the military also? He was. He's been medically retired since, but yes, he was for seven years, yes. Well, I don't know. It sounds like you've always been a caregiver. You know, we talk about the, the caregiver children. There's 1.6 million uh, kids between the ages of 8 and 18 who care for grandma and whatever. And, and you know, it's so sad because they don't really have a chance to be a kid. You know, they're right away facing adult um, pressures and, and stresses. The labor department isn't there to make sure that they get their 20-minute breaks and their 30-minute uh, lunch hours. Ooh. Tell us, because your firsthand experience, what was it like taking care of those people when you were younger? Was it kind of stressful? Um, actually, I like the work. Um, I think elderly people are amazing. I have learned so much about our country through them. Uh, it's given me an appreciation for some of the things that are taken for granted today. And so I've always just enjoyed being around them. I feel like they have so much to give. And yeah. um, so I just it just hasn't really been a stress for me. Good. Well, that's, that's, that's amazing. You know, I'm so grateful for the people who just have a love for older people. I know my, my middle daughter, uh, even as a kid, we, were, we lived next door to a sweet old lady named Lorraine, and she uh, was all alone, and she was like 90-something, and she could bend over and touch her toes. She walked like three miles a day, and she was so sweet, and, and uh, Cindy, our middle daughter, just, just adored her. You know, I think God gives some people just a certain love for animals, seniors, babies, and so, yeah, if it's your passion, it doesn't seem like work at all or it doesn't seem stressful at all. Um, so I wanted to ask you, that's, that's a pretty serious thing to go through with your son, finding out he has a, a rare 
brain tumor. Tell us what that was like when you found that out and you learned it for both of you. You know, how did you guys react to that news? My son was sick for about four months prior to his diagnosis. Um, he had gone to several different hospitals with certain, you know, various uh, symptoms and each place had said, you know, you're a 23 year old, nothing as serious has ever happened to you. So they first said it was the flu, then they said it was uh, gastro. And then one night he was out with his friends and he had passed out at a restaurant. They thought he had a stroke. Mm. And by the time we had gotten to the hospital, they had told us that he probably wasn't going to live. It was so serious and extreme. So they had brought us in, uh, brought my son in for to do a, an emergency procedure to try to get some of the fluid um, drained from his brain because where the tumor uh, was lodged, it was at the base of his brain stem. So all of the fluids in his brain were building up and causing all this pressure. Mm -hmm. So they did an emergency procedure that night, but they told us that he may come out on life support. He may come out on, they just didn't know what condition he would be in. The first procedure was tremendously successful. He came out a couple hours later. He was you know, hey, mom, how's it going? And I thought, this has to be a mistake, right? <laughs> I were about dead, and, and so they must have made some sort of mistake. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I want to see the x-ray. You know, I want to see what, what you're seeing because he seems fine now. And they had showed us the results of the MRI, and he had a, a 7 centimeter by 4 centimeter tumor lodged in the, in the base of his brain stem. Mm -hmm. And so that required um, not immediate surgery because that happened on a Friday. Surgeons don't work over the weekend, and that Monday was Veterans Day. So they did the um, surgery on November 12th, and um, it was an eight-hour procedure, and my son died four times on the operating table. Wow. Um, it was pretty serious. Yes. How long ago is this? It'll be five years this November. Wow. Yep. So we just came back from Boston and got our all clear um, on his scans. So not even any scar tissue, not even any signs of the tumor returning at all. So we're, we're very blessed. Mm. But because of that surgery, they had to cut his brain in half in order to get the tumor out. Oh my God. So he was, he was left with um, a lot of deficits. He has some speech. Uh, deficits. The main deficit is his mobility. He, um, he was wheelchair bound up until about two years ago, and now he's working, um, being able to walk with an assisted device, but he needs full-time care still. Um, so he has some sight, some coordination, um, problems at all affects the area of your brain that deals with your motor skills. Mm -hmm. So he, he worked two years to get himself back um, get back because after the surgery, he can only breathe and swallow. That was it. He's so a wow. long, yeah, you long can't, road. You can't cut the brain in half without it affecting something. It's very similar to my wife. You know, she has uh, global aphasia from a stroke she had 22 years ago. So her speech is very limited. Maybe she knows five words or so that could, that she constantly can use. She knows more than that, but not when she wants to use them. They're like in there somewhere, but she can't get, get to them like a stutterer searching for the words. Mm -hmm. And of course, she's paralyzed on the right side, but she's living a full life. She She's amazing. I mean, she makes us normal people look like whiners and complainers. She decided that she was just going to do everything she did before her stroke, and that was a lot, you know. And so your son sounds like he's quite a individual as well, overachiever before. Yes. What was he like before? <laughs> Type A my personality? Son, uh, my son was, I mean, just, he was just living life large, he, you know, single guy working on fighter jets, traveling all over the world, doing, you know, amazing work, making a lot of money. He just had the world, you know, uh, just amazing. He did a lot of things. He did snowboarding and, I mean, he did so many things, so active. And, um, although he doesn't do a lot of those things, and just similar to your wife, he's just like, I'm not going to let this stop me from living a life. And he's mm -hmm. done many amazing things and even more things probably he's done ill than he would have ever have done well. <laughs> so give me an example, just because I want to see how amazing he is. 
What are some <laughs> of the things that he has done afterwards? Like my wife has a powered chair and she travels all over the world with me and, and she loves it and she just inspires people. People, I, I've seen her talking to some guy in a restaurant while we're waiting for a table. You know, they're like 20 minutes talking, laughing at each other, slapping each other. He doesn't know she can't talk. I went to visit <laughs> 88 uh, uh. producers at a national publicity summit in New York and uh, the producers would see her on the other side of the room and come over to talk to her because she just is radiant, like the Queen of England. She dresses like to kill, makes me always look like a bum. You know, I always have to dress up when I'm around her. So tell me how wonderful your son is and how amazing he is. <laughs> so after all of this happened, of course, um, we say in some regards, it was, it was great. We're grateful that it happened so quickly because it never really got to sink into my son that his life was going to change in such a dramatic way. None of us could have known what the outcome was gonna be of that surgery. So it happened very quickly. So once the surgery was over and we got transferred to the Boston Hospital as we spent 102 days there, he went through radiation, um, proton therapy and some chemotherapy. And um, he was in an acute outpatient facility and I remember the doctor saying to me, you know, my expectations were too high um, for my son's outcome based on the severity of his condition. And basically, I told him that, you know, you can't set limits on people's ability or their mindset or what they're able to achieve. And so in 102 days, he was still wheelchair bound, but he had done he was able to eat. He was able to um, do all of his personal care. He was able to do so many things. Wow. And he came home after 102 days and immediately he got into um, an Air Force um, adaptive sports program. Mm. And he was able to um, participate in that. And that was for, so he started in November, so December, January, February, March. And so seven months he was in that program. So someone who was not able to even he just breathe and swallow when he got out, of, uh, got out of the surgery to he was competing with other wounded people from the Air Force and he was able to compete in the recumbent cycling and an air rifle. He got a silver medal in recumbent cycling at the Warrior Games. Um, he, so the Warrior Games is where all branches of the military come together and they compete sort of like the Olympics mm -hmm. sort of type thing. So from November to June, he went from being not even being able to sit up on the rowing machine, they had to strap him in, to now he's competing on a recumbent cycle. He gets second place. He does his personal best in air rifle when he never even, he wasn't even able to see when he woke up from his surgery. Um, and he was actually voted to be the uh, torchbearer for the Air Force for that for those games for his for how incredibly how incredible he's done his determination and his spirit and he is he is an amazing amazing man. <laughs> he sounds amazing. Yeah. He is amazing, and he's got an amazing cheerleader in you. Well, is that your only you. child? No, I have two other children. I have a daughter, and she is a nurse, and I Older, have a son. Younger. younger, so they're younger. So his sister is the next one in line, and then I, my youngest son, um, and and he works and you know has a normal life. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about his speech. What can he and what he can't he do with speech? He can do everything. Consistent? So he, he can, can have a normal can, conversation. He's got his use of the vocabulary and all that. He can. Um, his cognition wasn't affected at all. And he, um, it just sounds like he's super drunk when he talks. Um, he's and, a and he doesn't, speech impediment. A speech impediment. <laughs> it's called, um, 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 let me see. I can't even remember. But there's a medical term for it. Okay. Um, and... Basically, he can't respond. Like, if you're talking to him, it takes him a while to respond to what you're saying. So a lot of times people always talk over him oh. because he can't respond fast enough to what's happening. So he can speak to you, 
and he's intelligible, but he, it's just not as quick. And and um, and he has to process here. what he's hearing before he can. I think he's processed it. It just can't come out of his mouth fast enough. <laughs> well, listen. Let's take a break. Dave Nassani. Dave Nassani. Dave Nassani is a best-selling author. Where is the caregiver for the caregiver? That is where Dave Nassani comes in. Mr. Dave Nassani. Thank you. So you're you're needed. I am needed. Yeah. You are very yes. much needed. I am you're needed. kind of one of a kind, yes. right? The woman I loved had suffered a massive stroke, left her severely speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. Well, the first mistake the caregivers make is they don't know how to put their needs first. Now, the airlines tell us every time we go on an airplane that an oxygen mask will fall. Put your mask on first before you help your loved one with their mask. Right. For the next two years, our lives had become a living hell. And then there came a point where I finally had to just scream. I says, I can't take this anymore. Yeah. The second mistake that caregivers often make is they don't know how to ask for help. Now, everyone has one of these. Mm -hmm. It's called a cell phone. <laughs> you turn it on, yeah. you punch in the number, and you talk. Hello, Mom, I need help. Grandma's driving me crazy. I realize there's so many other caregivers out there who are suffering, who are going through tremendous pain and feeling lost and alone. And I wanted to help them triumph over that pain. I didn't want them to give up like I almost gave up. It's called Sanford and Son. Right. right. He was undeserved <laughs> guilt. It went something like this. Oh, oh, it's a big one. No, son, really, it's a big one. Elizabeth, I'm coming to meet you, honey. She's amazing to watch. She makes us normal people look like whiners and complainers. I mean, she's my hero. First of all, when someone is just wired like a caregiver, you know, they're, right. they're caring and they're giving and they give and give and give, but unfortunately they give until they burn themselves out. Mm -hmm. There's nothing left to give. Yeah. So now I host a popular iTunes podcast, The Caregiver's Caregiver Radio mm -hmm. Show, and I'm a best-selling author to my third book, It's My Life Too, Reclaim Your Caregiver Sanity. <laughs> I've been on my national book and media tour all across the country, just being on morning shows just like this one. Yeah. And I even shared the stage with Suzanne Summers at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Basically, I'm sharing my message how to prevent your loved one's illness or disease from actually killing you. Come and join our community of caregivers. Let us love on you. Let us support you. Dave is an amazing man. I was in tears when I heard his story. He spoke from his heart. Dave is really my idol because <laughs> he created something for caretakers. And I was a caretaker for my father. It's already 15 years and I'm still <laughs> crying. Every caregiver's life is a love story. Let me help you make that love story one of hope and triumph. Thank you very much. Yeah! And we're back with Betty O'Brien and my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruberg. So we're... if. If you're just joining us, we're interviewing uh, Betty, who is a veteran in the United States Air Force, and we are talking about her son, who had a very rare brain tumor, and they had to cut his brain open and cut it in half. That just sounds, oh my God, it's amazing what they can do, but he has some residual effects from that. So tell us about your grief process, Betty. What... Uh, what was that like when you found out, you know, that your son had a tumor, when you found out that he wasn't going to be 100% normal? Um, uh, was he ever suicidal? Was he ever depressed that he wasn't 100% normal? I think that um, initially my military, my military training went into high gear um, because <laughs> I didn't really think about anything. All I knew is my son was sick, I need to get him better, and what were the steps that I need to do to get there? Just tell me what we need to do, and we're going to just do this thing. And at the point that he, right after the surgery, we weren't sure if he was ever going to go back to his job, or he wasn't, but I always believed that he would. So that was a path that I took, and I was like, okay, here we go, we're just going to just do this thing, and he's going to get back to work, and life is going to be... Um, you know, the way it, way it was, and that's just that. So I don't think that it really set in until probably a year after we got 
got after he stopped his treatments and we were home and a whole year had gone by and then I just realized our life had completely changed. Like we were so concentrated on all the activity and all the treatments and doing all the things that we just didn't have time to just realize what had just happened to us. And so it was about a year later when I was just sad all the time. I just couldn't understand why am I so sad when my son is alive and I felt guilty like he's alive. So why should I be so sad about this? I should be so happy. I should be just celebrating that I have my son. But I was so upset. I was just so I just didn't understand what was happening. And one of the great things that has come out of this whole process is I went back to school and I ended up getting my degree and in one of my classes, which was a death and dying class, mm -hmm. we talked about dying and the grieving process and I realized that I was grieving my son. Even though he was alive, he was a yep. different person and I was grieving who he, he was, the person that he was before, but I didn't realize that. Right. And so going through that death and dying class and understanding the process of grief, the five steps of grief was so freeing. It was like I finally had an answer. I finally knew why I was feeling the way that I was feeling and I was able to accept and deal with that in a much better way. The new normal to get to acceptance. The new yes. <laughs> yep. And uh, so how long did you struggle with that, do you think? I think sometimes I still do struggle with it at times, especially when we're around friends that he had from before and I see them getting married and going on with their life and then my son is in a different spot in his life. So those are times that are really difficult and I feel like it's, you know, it's not as profound as it was, but I still think it shows up every now and then. Yeah. What's your experience with the grief process and what she's talking about, Adrian? Huh. <laughs> well, uh, I uh, I started to grieve from diagnosis on. So, I mean, I I I, I also just went straight ahead, even though I was grieving. I mean, not realizing um, that what I was feeling at that point was grief, but it, it didn't take long for me to realize. That, that all this is is anticipatory grief and then I realized no it's not just anticipatory grief because my husband had been diagnosed with with cancer and I knew he was going to diabetes but um, I was grieving for all the things that weren't things we couldn't and ha things that had changed and had no control over that we had, neither one of us had any control over. Right. So, and it's it's very real. And, yeah. and when I realized that, hey, you, you know, there's nothing wrong with feeling the way I'm feeling, then it somehow made it okay. And, and I felt better equipped to deal with it. Yeah. Are you married, Betty? No, I'm engaged. You're engaged. Congratulations. How long have you been engaged? <laughs> Since the week before Christmas. <laughs> ah. How nice. Where did you two meet <laughs> to get off the subject um, here? Well, it's... we actually met a very long time ago, okay. and our lives took different paths, and it's amazing how God works things out that our yes. paths crossed just before my son got sick. Ooh. So he's yeah. been support to you, I would assume. In um, yeah, emotionally, he's Emotional. been very supportive. Yep, it's been extremely supportive. And um, I mean, we had our challenges. When you have a sick child, it's extremely challenging. We oh. we broke up a couple times. We got back <laughs> together a couple times. Uh, it, it was it had been very uh, difficult on our relationship, um, yeah. especially because. My son was getting treatment in Boston. <clears throat> we live in Enfield. That's quite a tra distance to travel. Um, and I literally uh, did not leave the hospital for 102 days. I stayed yeah. with my son the entire time. 
and so not coming home was a, it was definitely a challenge on our on sir yeah you know dr laura always says that in a second marriage uh the children should always come first and a lot of times that spouse doesn't realize that <clears throat> because the spouse is coming in as a new person right. and so um how important uh, is your son right now? I mean, does he live with you? No, my son was fortunate enough. Um, so he's fortunate enough to be mostly independent now. Um, oh, good, he, good. Uh, he built a home uh, in another town, and it was a fully accessible home, so he's able to have a home that works for him. He needs care so he has full-time care but mm -hmm. we don't sleep over the um the people who care for him and i we don't live there anymore we come in the morning and we leave at night um so he's pretty much at night by himself but it i mean he can he can ambulate and do things um he doesn't need yeah. um so you're slowly anymore. getting your life back you're slowly you know <laughs> reducing the time of being his full-time caregiver etc He's slowly becoming more independent. He's slowly uh, depending on other caregivers so that you can live your life, get engaged, be married, et cetera. Yes. <laughs> You're very fortunate. Uh, I, yes. this, I want, I'm curious about who is paying for his care, this companion. I hope the VA. I hope the VA, but I, I, I just want to know because – on my site, we have a, a veterans community, and there are problems. So I wanted to hear about that. Yeah, Kevin is um, paying for his own care. Uh, he, he pays for his own care, and uh, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to advocate. Um, the The veterans process is a very difficult process, and going through this process, I saw a lot of injustice and, and inequalities in the system, and I saw things that weren't right. So for the caregiver program for the military, um, it only includes injured and wounded um, veterans. It doesn't include ill, and my son... Mm -hmm is an ill veteran because he got brain cancer, so he wasn't he wasn't wounded in combat or wasn't over in a um, zone where there was war going on. And so he is excluded from the program. And that's been my biggest um, advocacy for, for veterans and for my son. And being a part of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation is to get ill included in the caregiver law so that they can be um, included in getting and not paying for their care. They shouldn't be paying for their care, but he does pay for his care. So it sounds like he's supporting himself. How? He's su well, he's supporting himself and he's also supporting me. Yeah. Because I can't work because I work for him full time. So um, I'm unable to, um, I'm unable to work. So he pays me and and that's a whole other situation about the guilt and the shame of having your child taking care of you when you're fully able to work. It's not like I have am dementia or Alzheimer's right. or not sick, um, and my son has to fully support me. Um, and so, yeah, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult situation. Dave's cut out again, so I'll <laughs> ask you a question. Okay. Um, how, how does he support himself? So when you get um, retired or released from the military, it goes based on your grade um, and how many time um, and how many years you have in service. And it also goes based on the level of your um, the percentage of your disability. Right. Right. So that's okay. how it's a formula that they figure out. Okay. Yeah. So. How many hours these days are you uh, his caregiver? How many hours a week or a day? Do I do it? Yeah, I do it three days a week, and it's 10 hours a day, three days a week. Mm -hmm. so will that number be reducing, and, and he'll be uh, uh, no. counting that on? Number will, no, that number will never reduce. My son can't drive. Um, so 
he relies on someone all the time to if he wants to do anything. So he'll need someone during the hours that everyone's working and doing things to help him. When he's in an upright walking position, he needs to be monitored because um, he is a very high fall risk. Yeah. So he has to have someone constantly monitoring him when he's up and about doing his daily activities. I see. So I'm very happy you're getting married. That will help the finances, I'm sure. That will help your emotional support. That will help a lot of things. Do you agree? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Dave. On that. No, that's, I'm trying to be optimistic here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's it's not really a help. It's it is uh it is a strain when you have um, someone who is able to work but is not able to work. Um, so it is a strain, and um, you know we've just ex like you said you have to accept the situation and make the best of it. And so that's basically where we're at now. We've we've accepted that this is our life and this is how it is and. We'll just have to make the best of the situation. Adrian, you're very familiar with uh, uh, veterans. You've got a, a group over there. Is this a typical uh, issue that comes up with the vets? Yes, it is a very typical issue. That's why I wanted to know how, uh, how his care was being paid for. Um, Veterans' benefits are not what they should be, and I applaud Betty for working with the Dole Foundation uh, and being such an advocate. I mean, advocacy is something where I find caregivers in general don't make enough noise. They're, they're not heard. They just keep quiet and do their job, and they don't have time to go out there and, and argue for themselves. And advocates, effective advocates, are few and far between. So bravo. <laughs> Thank you. I think of one of the problems, oh, I'm sorry. I think one of the problems is not only um, for the veteran getting what they deserve, but it's also for the caregiver getting for what they deserve. When I took on this role, I didn't realize how much I was going to be losing. I didn't realize that I was going to be unemployable, that I was uh -huh. going to be losing years of paying into Social Security. Mm -hmm. And so that's concerning because will I ever be able to, um, will I ever be able to take care of myself or will I always be 100% reliant on my son for my to be able to live. And I never really realized that those were situations when I stepped into this role. And, and so I also am trying to advocate for a better financial position for caregivers. Absolutely. Uh, through their jobs and through um, what they're losing in Social Security, not paying into it, and, and all of those things that we don't really realize that are happening to us. Yeah, right here in the state of Hawaii, they're very, this is this is the most caregiver friendly state in the entire union. Mm. They passed. Uh, they have a name for caregivers. It's called Kapuna, and it's you know the family and uh, the support and and caregivers. And so they passed a, a Kapuna bill in Hawaii that allows um, caregivers who, even if they're working full time, forty hours a week, a respite of fifteen hundred dollars a month. And so they are the only state in the union who's doing this. Now, they, they didn't offer very many. They only had so much money, but 35 lucky caregivers are getting $1,500 a month so that mm -hmm. they can continue to work and pay for some caregiving, et cetera. And next year, perhaps the number might go higher. But I think this is a great model for all the states in the union. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I'm doing seven speaking events here. Um, one I just finished at the University of Hawaii for the Center on Aging, and she was so excited at my talk. She said, wow, you know, there are so many people who need to hear you. And so she booked me at a friend's event that's coming up <laughs> Saturday, and there are politicians there. Uh, there's a former state senator uh, for the state of Hawaii. There is a uh, U.S. House of Representatives there. There are other people in, in the university who are uh, into 
things uh, in the aging department that will help. So I'm excited to meet new people and to share my vision for for things and, and then take it back to the mainland, hopefully, and, and try yeah. to advocate uh, respite for caregivers. We are saving the government billions and billions. Billions. And billions. Like Carl Sagan says, billions hundreds and billions. Of, hundreds of billions of dollars yeah. a year. Maybe even a trillion. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh oh. I mean, it's uh, it, it it's a grave situation, and um, uh, caregivers just do. They, I understand why you know there's there's no caregivers walk. Well, caregivers can't get out of the house to run or walk <laughs> to raise money, so their friends have to do it for them. Um, but no one's been able to organize enough people to. To really speak up and and get out there and and no. make make the noise that I'm talking about. We have to take a break because my computer told me danger. Will Robinson, your battery is dying. I'm plugged into a wall, <laughs> an outlet out here on the patio, but that outlet obviously is dead. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome, caregivers. Thank you so much for finding your way to our community of loving and supportive caregivers. We as caregivers understand and know the day-to-day -day feelings of guilt, fear, and loneliness. But guess what? There is hope. I, Dave the Caregiver's Caregiver, along with my team of experts and caring caregivers, have made the site just for you. We are a community of caregivers that understands and supports you wherever you are in your journey. We are a place to connect with other caregivers, but more importantly, a place to get practical, actionable help. There are lots of ways for you to get support. First of all, you can download our welcome pack. This will get you started on your Thrive journey. Next, you can ask and get answers to your questions by posting them here in our private Facebook groups. You can also get live online support by attending one of our live weekly Connect webinars. You can get practical, actionable advice by listening to our weekly podcast. You can hear and read other stories about other caregivers' experiences. Plus, add your own in our weekly Share Your Story forum, posted every Tuesday in the Facebook group. You can access essential resources and download practical Thrive Solutions Packs, all of which are geared to help you thrive as a caregiver. We know funds are tight, so we offer all of our individual Thrive Solutions packs. Or for even a better deal, you can get lifetime access to all of our resources. Again, we are here to support you and help you thrive and to enjoy your life as a caregiver. And remember, this is a place to get hope, not just cope. Wow. You have an amazing, powerful story, Betty and are such an advocate for your son and for caregivers. Talk louder? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. You're welcome. So, um, you already discussed some of the adjustments you had to make to your life. Let's look into the future now. Are things going to get better as far as, uh, you know, your time and finances, et cetera, your son's progress, your son's independence? Are you optimistic for the future? as a caregiver? I've always been optimistic for the future. Just how <laughs> does that play out into your everyday life? So with cancer, it's a little bit daunting because um, my son's cancer is a very aggressive cancer. Typically, um, things start to happen around the five-year mark. It could come back. He could have other complications. So the five-year mark is really critical. Yeah. And so to try to not... Um, feel hostage to the fact that it could come back. Um, it takes like everything I have every day to push that down and, and go forward and say he's not sick. There's nothing there. There's no reason for me to believe that this is coming back. And so I need to go forward. And that was one of the main reasons why I ended up getting finishing my education um, and doing that and getting a plan B just in case something happened. Um, so keep moving forward. Um, I don't think that people realize how incredibly difficult that can be. Because um, it's not like, I think people see me and like, oh, you're, you know, you're doing great. Everything's wonderful. You're, you know, you're doing this and that and the other thing. But they don't understand 
how incredibly difficult it is to keep your mind trained to constantly be looking forward because it's so easy to get um, caught up in the what ifs. What if? The what yeah, if. so how many more years before you hit the five year mark? There'll be five years this November. Oh, well, it's but right he just around had, the He just had an MRI and. Yes, and everything is all clear. Things were all clear. Yeah. So November's yeah. just around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. It's looking, so, it's looking very, very good for you. Yes. Yes. Now, what did you go back to school for? What would you like to be doing? So, my dream job is to be talking about this exact thing that we're talking about and getting out there and sharing my story. I do share my story with um, the organization that helped us stay, helped me stay in Boston for 102 days, the Fisher House Boston mm -hmm. um, is a military organization that paid for me to stay in Boston with my son. And so I go out and I share my story um, to help raise funds for their organization. And I I'm hoping Kevin and I, Kevin is my son, yes. um, will be writing a book soon. Um, Good. So hopefully doing that and, and getting out and speaking and sharing our story. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit unique, the mother and son aspect, especially from the military aspect. Both yes. Of us being veterans and Kevin, sort of a unique situation and how it all came to be. My son and I were, were a little bit estranged before he got sick and so how um, the story of reconciliation and forgiveness is a huge part of our story. And so I just want to share share all of that, you know, with people and just give them to let them know that um, a diagnosis isn't a destination. It's uh, just the beginning of so many other things to come. Do you have a date yet on your engagement, uh, your wedding? No. <laughs> I'm just so happy, Dave, to have the engagement. I'm just like, yes, yes, one step closer to normal. So, well, <laughs> but between you. the between the two of us, we have eight children and a grandchild. So, wow, <laughs> so eight is enough. Like, eight is enough, step. right? <laughs> one step at a time. Wow. I'm sorry I keep bringing that up, but it's it's great news, you know. You know how many caregivers would love to be in your position? <laughs> that you know, November's just around the corner. You'll that that big question mark will be taken care of, hopefully for the better. And to, to actually have, you know, people usually get a divorce who uh, are caregivers because you know one spouse says, "Oh my gosh, I didn't I, sign up for this." You know, you're not. I, I'm getting the raw end of the stick, and I get. I don't even get crumbs and this and that. So you're very fortunate. I mean, you've got a lot of things going on for you, and I hope you can see those positive things. And I know you're a realist and a pragmatic uh, person in the military. They teach you to be that way. But I, I hope you can be optimistic because you've got a lot of things to be optimistic about. Yes, definitely. I think all those things that you talked about, we did go through. Mm -hmm. And those things did happen to us. And we had to fight really hard to come back from all of those things. And mm -hmm. um, it did seem hopeless and like it wouldn't um, fix itself, but we're both very strong people. We're very strong minded and very strong willed. And so we were like cancer took this from us and we're not gonna let it keep taking things from us. And I told my son, I said, you could die tomorrow, but if you live the life that you want on your terms, you've beat cancer. And mm -hmm. that's what how we live our life. We live our life beating cancer every day because we're doing stuff and we're not letting it keep us down and we're not letting it rule our lives. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in living your life as if it was the last day of your life because, you know, tomorrow is not promised. So um, there are lots of caregivers listening to you right now and they would like to glean the wisdom because you have a lot of wisdom that you've gained. Wisdom doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come easy. So what things can you share to the caregivers who are watching who are not where you're at, you know, yet? Uh, give them some hope. Give them some of your insights on how, you know, how you cope, how you don't give up, how you recharge your batteries, you know, how you guilt with, how you deal with the guilt and the shame of having to rely on your son to support you and all of that stuff. Because it's not, it's not uncommon. Everyone is going through it. 
And hopefully you're getting support. Hopefully you're in some kind of uh, caregiver support group, I hope. I definitely, <laughs> I am. I am. The Hidden Heroes is the support group for military caregivers. Wonderful. Um, I am a part of that. I also um, do see, um, seek professional help. Um, I do see a therapist, so that helps. Um, but I think the main thing that I want to share with people is and this is how I basically have lived my life. On the outside, I look like I have it all together. On the outside, I look like everything's going well. When my son was sick, I didn't want people to think my son was sick. I wanted to think, them to think he was amazing and he was doing incredible and everything was going well and we were doing all of this and that. But I think that that did a disservice. It did a disservice by not telling the truth, by yeah. not sharing the struggle, by not sharing how I was feeling, how alone and desperate, and I was alone because everyone was working and going on with their lives, and I had to make life and death decisions, medical decisions for my son, and I never talked about that. I never talked about how hard it was to do that, and so I think we do a disservice if we don't share the truth about what we're going through because everyone looked at me and like all my friends well oh you got it together so you don't need someone to come over and have a coffee with you and talk and you know support you and everything because you just got it all together everything's going good Kevin doesn't need anything because his mom is there and taking care of everything and we they don't they don't need us and in fact we do need our friends and we do need their support and we Absolutely. do need their help we do need their help. And so if I could encourage anyone, I would absolutely say to share your story, not, not for pity or anything like that, but to share to help other people realize that they're not alone, that this is very common as we've shared. This is a very common thing that people go through and you're not alone. And I think, I, I think that that's what I would say. And then that I would also like to say that no one ever talked to me about transitioning out of caregiving, mm -hmm. that I always felt it was my responsibility. So I never felt like I could get an agency to come to come in and take care of him for a couple hours because I felt like I'm the mom, I should do it. Yes. This is my responsibility. And so That's the perfectionism I, in you. That yep. has to go <laughs> because nobody yeah. is perfect. You know, maybe the military taught you to be perfect. I'm but, the only one that can do it. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you that Usher is the person who changed my mind because I saw him on TV doing an interview, and he said that when he turned 21, he had fired his mom as his manager because she had done it her, his whole <coughs> life. And he said, I would never be able to become the man that I was meant to be if my mom continued to have this much control over my life. And so in January, I came to my son and I said, I feel like you'll never become the man you're meant to be if I'm always with you. What woman's going to find a way into your life with the mom constantly being there? You know, and the I'm manager constantly... mom. Exactly. And so I said, we need a, we need a separation. So what steps are you taking up. to do that? <laughs> Or breaking up. So I feel like transitioning out of the caregiving role is something that I feel that people should really cons yeah. take a look at. It's not a life sentence. It's, yeah. It has its purpose, and you can be creative and still be involved, but not have the 100% responsibility. Yeah, I'm so glad you're writing your book because all of that stuff can go in the book, the honesty, the pain. You know, Definitely. that book is going to help so many people. And hopefully your son has changed his lifestyle, you know, is, is eating healthy diet and exercise that, that fights cancer, you know, with whatever exercise he can do. I mean, if he's competing in uh, athletic events uh, with yeah. other disabled people, uh, he can, <laughs> Sorry, he can certainly do that. <laughs> so he's not doing that. He's not doing that. Um, my philosophy and his philosophy is um, – I almost died and I'm going to live every day as if it's the last. So I'm going to do whatever it is that I want to do. And if yeah. I want to eat chocolate cake, I'm going to eat chocolate cake. <laughs> sounds like my wife. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And, you know, she has terrible eating habits. She's a gourmet cook and uh, eats good food. But, you know, and, you know, how can you blame them? I mean, they're the ones who went through that. Right. They're quality of life is so important to them and 
you know, maybe he, if he knows where he's going when he dies, then then that gives the person a lot of peace. And yes. uh, you know, I I certainly am looking forward to the next life because this one kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I make the best. Of it. It's a good life, but it's a hard life. It's a hard life, and it's not a perfect life. And and we're told in the Bible, you know, that that we should have our eyes to the next life because this this is just a training field, you know, boot camp. Who likes boot camp? You know? <laughs> this is you. boot I camp. <laughs> life is boot camp. Yes. Oh, I, it was the best worst thing I ever did. <laughs> I have one another question oh. for Betty uh, quickly. Um, sure. Does your son have friends supporting him? No. His friends, um, his friends went away very quickly, um, and he, there's not very many people, I would say maybe one or two people that have kept in contact with him now that, you know, we're five years out, and, um, and it's hard because he doesn't drive, so for him to build up new social circles is extremely difficult. Even with the sports and all the activities. Yeah, the sports he did um, in nineteen and and uh, two thousand and fifteen. So he hasn't been a part of the sports program because it's like once you've done this yeah, and done and competed done and all that, then you don't go back to it. It's kind of like it's you know, one and done type of thing. Yeah. Um, and so he doesn't have that anymore, but he does participate in some um, adaptive activities in the community. There's a canoeing program, a kayaking program, and a cycling program that we do okay. um, in the community. And it's all about um, people of all abilities sharing public spaces. So we do it with able-bodied people, which is something that's really important to him because he's like, yeah. Mom, I don't always want to be with disabled people because I yeah. want to push myself to do more and, and do more. So I want to be around able-bodied people too. Yeah, um, my so wife is the same way. Thing. She doesn't like hanging around dis disabled people. She wants to be around normal people. She wants to look at herself as normal. And yes. uh, they have a lot in common. I think they'd be good yes. friends. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, absolutely. this is normal. It's just their new normal. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so, and, yeah, go ahead. So does he, is he trying to find new challenges to be challenged, you know, because yeah, how do you fight boredom? How do you fight mediocrity? How do you fight just the status quo? You know, you would think that someone like him who who did what he did and says, okay, that's great. Now I want to do this. You know, okay, now I want to jump out of an airplane. You know, I want to whatever. You know, does he have that kind of an attitude anymore? Yes, absolutely. He's uh, he has his house now, and that's a major project because it's on two and a half acres of land. So he's got to mow the grass, and he's got to <laughs> keep himself busy. And it wasn't landscaped. I mean, they built the house, but it wasn't landscaped. So he's done a lot with the landscaping and. Um, he's going to be doing a house renovation, even though it was just built. He's going to do some renovations and things like that that he wanted to do. And so, yeah, he's keeping himself busy, which is really good for me as a mom to see that he's looking forward and planning things. That's great. Um, yeah. Because yeah. That I know that he's hopeful about his future, too, and he talks about the future a lot. So to me, that's a great sign. Yep. And I agree with you. I think you do need to wean yourself from him. He needs to know. Because if something happened to you, as like 30% of caregivers die because they don't take care of themselves. If you were to die, God forbid, you know, he will he will survive. He will get around. He'll find someone else to do what you did. You know, maybe they won't be as good. <laughs> maybe they won't no, do it. No, definitely not. <laughs> you know, maybe the coffee you make uh, is better than anybody, whatever. <laughs> but you're not doing him any favors by by doing that. I'm glad to hear that you're backing off and you're doing less and less and less. But there has to come that day, maybe in November, when he gets a, a great report. He says, okay, you don't need me anymore. You know, of course, I'll still be your mom. I'll still check in on you. But, you know, you need to start, uh, uh, you know, put breaking on your big, away. Put on your well, big boy pants, use a crude uh, uh, expression. Yeah, his, life, his life doesn't won't accommodate that much of a separation but i'm glad that you brought up that point because i feel like 
you know, I raised my son from when he was a baby to, to go out into the world and become who he was meant to be. Now he got sick. He had to come back into my care. And now I feel like I've taken him again because he could only breathe and swallow when he got out of the surgery. So I had right. to teach him how to do everything again. Eat, yeah. walk, talk, all of those things. So now I've had to go through this process of re gearing my mind up to i'm going to have to let him go at some point right i'm gonna have to break this you know i'm going to have to let him be who he was meant to become which is more difficult because he's not as abled as he was mm -hmm. so it's like a second time of letting him go which is very difficult even the birds know how to do it they push him out of the nest you know right. and somehow you know if it looks like they're going to hit they the ground they swoop under him and they'll try it again you know throw him in the nest then push him out of the nest so you've got to be like that mother bird let me, i will ask you another question um okay. how supportive is your son of your engagement very supportive that's very supportive. wonderful yeah, my son has, uh, my fiance has been with him since the night we got the call to come to the hospital. And so very, very supportive. That's great. Yes. Thank you. That's good. Too. So how can someone, how can someone get a hold of you? So they can get a hold of to me on find Instagram. Find out more. Oh. Yep. They can get a hold of me through Instagram. Um, it's one, the number one, Bodacious Life. Um, you can find oh. me on Facebook, one Bodacious Life on Facebook. So these are all new uh -huh. things that I'm doing to um, Good for you. promote myself. And so um, right. we're under, um, we're not fully up and operational, but these things are, we're starting. So you can find me at one bodacious life at gmail.com as well. How do we get a hold of Adrian Gruberg? Adrian, A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E -N -N -E, at the caregiverspace.org. And all the other links and information will be there on uh, the Facebook page, on the uh, the website, thecaregiverspace.org. Awesome. Well, and I am caregiverdave.com. Just go there and join our membership site. We have a free gift for you, caregiverdave.com. If you're not a caregiver, send it to a caregiver that you know and love. You just might be saving their life. So until next time, we will see you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Caregiver's Caregiver radio program with Dave Nassani.